Welcome back from the break. I think our panel has done a fantastic job in prepping us for our next sessions, which is mostly going to be technology based. And I think some of the uh, technologies that were talked about on the panel um, are being brought up here. So like our AI natural language processing, um, amongst other things. So uh, to kick off our AI session, AI and sensory technology session, I'd like to introduce Heidi Schmidt. Dr. Heidi Schmidt, she's the Interim Radiologist in Chief for the Joint Department of Medical Imaging. She has established an AI center, so she's the perfect person to lead this conversation. Uh, please welcome Dr. Schmidt. Thank you, and uh, welcome everybody. We do have a very brief session, but a very exciting session ahead of us. Um, with uh, three different talks covering different aspects of the um, human-machine interaction. So we will hear from um, biomarkers to biomaterials, um, biomedical engineering solution, and also some um, explanation on the idea of explainable AI. Um, so first speaker, I would like to introduce um, Alexey Boutillier from Montreal. So Montreal, as we all know, um, hosts one of the most uh, famous AI hubs in the country, the Miele, the, the Quebec Institute of Machine Learning. And he's on the board there working together with Joshua Bengo, and I'm pretty sure that name sounds familiar to all of you. Um, Alex is co-founder co of um, Imagia, and if you may have heard it probably from a very recent press release in um, May this year where um, a large government fund um, um, award was um, um, funded to a collaboration between Imagia and the Terry Fox Research Institute, and I'm very excited to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you, Luke, and thank you, David, for helping us on this uh, proposal. So we're very happy to work with about 95 members in a pan-Canadian initiative to uh, change healthcare. So today I'm going to talk to you about time. I think time is really the most important thing that we have. I was uh, living in Europe. I sold my company, the previous one, not Imagia, and I really thought that I had all the time in the world. That was about for three years. I was retired, and then I got the call from my father. Unfortunately, he got cancer, so this is where I decided to, to go back and to, de to do something useful for my life. And uh, this is, and when you have someone in your family that have problem, you, you basically use your skills. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about time. And before talking about artificial intelligence and how it can save time, uh, and before you do AI, you should look into ethics. So there was brief topics to mo this morning about ethics uh, and encourage you to read the Montreal Declaration Responsible uh, AI. There's 10 principles, pretty easy to understand, translated in many language. Um, and so those are great, there are principles. And what you can do even more and even better is take those principles and apply by design. So I'm gonna focus on one of the principle, which is privacy. Because when you talk about AI, you talk about a lot of data and you, you essentially use patient data to make discovery. So don't, ju don't just use the, the, the AI uh, principle, make it by design. So I'm gonna cover that a little bit in the presentation. So if you're not familiar with modern artificial intelligence, one of the technique is called deep learning. So I encourage you to read the book, Deep Learning, by Yeshua Benjou and co-authors. And what's really interesting is they use the technique deep learning to automatically translate the book in French, called L'Apprentissage Profond. It doesn't work perfectly, it's about 90% there. Um, so it saves time for the translator. And it's a good, um, I would say, example on how we can use AI on text. Because if you look at reports, even in the same language, from various hospitals, the concepts sometimes are the same, but they're not expressed the same way. So it's really important to have a natural language understanding of concepts. So how do we use AI essentially to unleash its full potential in the personalized, personalized healthcare? So I'm gonna focus on that time aspect, and I'm gonna talk about digital biomarker. So what's a digital biomarker? 
you can correlate it to a physical biomarker. Essentially, it will discover feature that links two type of data. Previously, we were discussing with uh, Dr. Smith, uh, if you can link an image to um, an anomaly, this is a first type of digital biomarker uh, on the far left. We call that AI. Previously, it was called CAD. It's been there around for nine, since 1998 with the breast uh, mammal CAD. Um, those technology, those CAD system will just increase in accuracy. They will augment physician capability. They will not replace them. But that, this will not change the way we do healthcare. It will just reduce times and errors by combining human and uh, the machine. Where it is interesting uh, in the matter of time is using those digital biomarker and patient data to predict, so you're using patient data, so you're using digital information, you can use that to predict a physical test. So typically a phys physical test is invasive by definition, it's uh, time consuming and um, it's expensive. I'm gonna give you an example of how you can use an image or a video to predict pathology. That doesn't mean that you replace pathology. That means that you could trigger pathology test or biopsy when it's required and maybe not when it's not required. And sometimes there's too much biopsy and for those who didn't get a biopsy, maybe some of them should have get one. Even more interesting, you can look at radiology images and see macroscopic effect of specific gene mutation. This is called radiomics. So you can use images to predict an EGFR biomarker even from a low dose CT scan. So this is where I really think that radiology will just expand and not reduce in terms of capability. And where we're going next is essentially be able to predict response just by looking at image. We already at Sunnybrook, they were able to show that by looking at an image, you can predict response of chemotherapy. So you could also look at patient data and predict complications. And this is where you can start having a more personalized healthcare system that is affordable. So I'm gonna show you a quick demo of a product that is a work in progress that we do with Olympus. Uh, essentially looking at a video during a colonoscopic procedure for screening program, cancer colon. Uh, that procedure, um, essentially the polyps are almost always removed and sent to pathology lab. For 25 million colonoscopy done each year, that's a billion dollar cost of analyzing benign polyps. So we could use AI to on the spot uh, tell you if it's a benign or malignant polyp. The polyp will still be removed, but you'll end up with two tests. One physical test and one software test, one AI test. So we know that pathology is not perfect and it's not because of the pathologist, it's because sometimes the sample is not cut correctly. But by combining the, 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 the digital test and the physical test, you're gonna increase the surveillance interval and for those 11% of people for which pathology have failed, uh, probably the surveillance interval will be much more better. So here it is with uh, Dr. Rex. It's a work that we always do with clinicians. We don't work alone, the AI people. You need to involve uh, clinicians and... Uh, so I want to demonstrate the AI program in um, action. There's a, a very small polyp here, a couple of millimeters in size. In white light, it looks like it has a little bit of a central valley sign um, in it. I'm going to turn the close uh, focus on, and then to activate the AI, all we need to do is turn on the narrowband uh, imaging. You can see that the program is uh, really immediately developing high confidence that this is a type 2 lesion. It'll do it either in the near focus, it'll also do it uh, in standard focus from a little uh, greater distance. So this would be a great candidate if we actually could perform resecting the scar, uh, this lesion has basically zero chance of having cancer in it. We could remove it and uh, throw it away. But it demonstrates uh, nicely the performance of, of the model uh, with a high confidence diminutive type 2 lesion. Okay.
with the sigmoid uh, colon now, again, still with our pediatric scope. We've got about a five millimeter lesion. We'll take a close look at it. And uh, the program is telling us that this is a type two lesion. I'm just gonna try to get in here close to verify that that's the case. I do think that the surface pit structure is primarily uh, tubular and um, yeah, definitely a uh, type two lesion. Uh, the program knew that before uh, I did. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop right there. I really like when the one of the top key opinion leader, Dr. Rex, says. The, the AI program saw that before I did, so it's really a good combination of human-machine. The question is how you can discover more and more of those digital biomarker at scale, and this is exactly what we're doing with the Terry Fox Research Institute and 95 members across the country, including UHN and Tecna, so thank you. And if you see uh, in that graph, the patient is at the center. So the patient consent is really important to make sure that we engage and we do AI when there's consent. Um, it's really a public-private partnership. When there's, when there's commercialization, there are royalty splits among the participants. So we can see that we will be able to fund ongoing research. Uh, so that's a project that was announced uh, in May and we're completing the, the agreement with uh, Canada as we speak. About $158 million project. Um, that's a complex diagram, but essentially I'm gonna drive it very quickly. Don't think about AI as an end product, the one that I saw, uh, that I show you. Think about AI as helping you as a tool to accelerate the pace at which you're conducting research both for medical device or pharma as well. So the first thing you want to do when you, you, um, you drive uh, project research is to do patient cohorting. So that's the first thing that goes out from the clinician to the bubble one. You want to do cohorts of patient. So going back to the books, you can use natural language processing to provide inclusion and exclusion criteria from a conceptual uh, notion to get those patient cohorts in a matter of hours instead of a matter of months. The second thing you do in that same bubble one is you want to label the data. You want to tell to the machine for the training, this data contain, contains a cancer of this type and this other type of data does not contain a cancer and you want to figure it out what are the features. Typically those are done by experts. We want to have machine instead do the labeling. So there are techniques called weak labeling and other type of techniques where you help the human to label the data much more efficiently and try to remove the bias that is done in the labeling. So at the end of step one, you have a nice friendly cohort of data, friendly in the term of AI, to be able to discover automatically what are the features that do correlate between those two type of data. And this is where the interesting part is, is you do that in your own institution. The data doesn't get out of the institution. We use a concept called federated learning, where we can, can combine multiple data from multiple institutions, and essentially the data doesn't leave the institution. It's the AI that goes around, if I can use that analogy, and capture the, the learning. And then it's important to have a regulatory path and a commercial path to make sure that those discovery would be licensed out to medical device makers, pharmaceutical maker, and test makers. So if you listen carefully, the data never gets out. It's only the discovery. So it's really important not to monetize the data, not to sell the data. Some organizations do that. We prefer not to do it because it's not ethical, but by design, we want to and we want to monetize the discovery. So going back to a few examples, I'm going to go quickly to some other video. Nice interface, we want to empower the clinical researcher so they can do their research at their own time. They can use AI without being an AI expert. And I'm going to show you some example on advanced project on which we are working. So now you see a long image and the nodules that you see here where 
the model was trained on data without labeling the data. We didn't tell to the model which data contain a nodule and which data contain a malignant nodule. So the system, and you see the, the nodule will start to appear in purple, the, the, this model is able not only to recognize anomaly, but malignancy automatically. So we're trying to remove the human bias in labeling the data, which is very time consuming. The next step, we would want to be able, just from an image, predict specific type of genetic mutation that, like EGFR, for which there are specific treatment uh, that are on the market. Um, so that's a trick question for Heidi. What you see here is not a CT scan of a lung. This is really a, a generated image from a computer. So we show to a model a lot of normal CT scan, and now the machine can show us what's a normal CT scan in terms of feature. So we really think that the machine is capturing normality. And what a better way to try to understand abnormality is to really capture the normality. One other concept that I want to uh, tell you is about making sure that we bring human in the loop to implement what we call AI safety. So there are certain type of data, if you look at those bubbles, uh, and the line in the middle is where you're not certain which data those are. Is it cancerous or not cancerous? Uh, those data are true or false. If you're on the far end, there are some type of data for which the machine can, with high confidence, tell you this is what it is. So it's important to have th that understanding when you build a model and also when you use a model. So if you use a model for a binary classification, yes or no, the model should tell you yes, no, and I don't know for those type of classes. The final, um, uh, let's see, illustration I want to show you is around explainability. So we always say that AI is a black box. In fact, it's not a black box. It's a transparent box, so you can connect to the various levels of the network and extract the feature. So in this example, we had two type of nodules, one with very low survival rate, less than three months, and one, I would say, with a little bit better, more than 12 months. So if I were to ask a clinician, how many features in the image can you see that will correlate to survival? There might be a few. In fact, the machine was able to find 3,000 of them, and you can rank them in the log plot like this, and you see that three of them are much more statistically relevant than the others. If we take one of them, and it, this was discovered automatically by the algorithms, shows something that we already know, that it's related to the heterogeneity of the surrounding tissue of the tumor. The two others, of course, are very interesting, and this is where we start to go into hypothesis-free research. We enter data, and patterns are emerging. So thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you, Alex. So I did note quite a few questions that would lead to a long discussion, and I'm afraid if we would get into um, what does this mean for the future of radiologists, we probably wouldn't have uh, time for the speaker. So I would say we invite the next two speakers, and then we start the discussion afterwards. So as the next speaker, I would like to um, invite Cesar Marquezin, I hope I pronounced that right, um, to the podium, who comes from a little bit closer to us. He is from the KITE, the research arm of the Toronto Rehab Institute. Um, his work is directly impacting patients and uh, focusing on the neurorehabilitation neuro after spinal cord injury. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Um, I would first like to tell you that this morning I woke up with an unusually deep voice. I, I don't normally sound this sexy, so <laughs> I hope I don't run out of uh, voice in the middle of my stock. Um, I, I have to tell you, I, I don't actually use AI, but I'm delighted to share this work with you. It's uh, quite a bit different from the amazing work that Alexander just showed us. Um, and it has to do with rehabilitation of people who have become paralyzed. I understand that in the previous session, uh, uh, some of Ms. Valkyrie was in the panel. Um, so, 
having said that, in the last two decades, uh, a technique called functional electrical stimulation therapy has become a very important tool uh, that therapists can use to help people recover uh, after paralysis. Uh, this is usually following stroke and spinal cord injury. So stroke affects the ability to move voluntarily because of a lesion to the brain. And in the case of spinal cord injury, the connection between uh, the brain and the rest of the body is affected. This is a cartoon of what FES therapy actually looks like. So a therapist will normally ask a patient to perform a particularly, uh, not particularly, but a, a, a specific voluntary movement, functional. After a few seconds, the therapist will push a button and then that triggers electrical stimulation. And this electro stimulation is designed to produce muscle contractions and the muscles are selected very carefully so that the movement that results from the, 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 the electrical discharges matches the movement that is uh, being uh, practiced. And this is done over and over and over, over a course of usually one hour. Uh, during that hour, we may be able to practice multiple movements, so not just one, right? These are examples of the type of movements that we may actually use during therapy. And really, the reason why I'm showing you this is to, to, to bring to your attention the fact that they're very rarely simple movements. They're, they're usually, you know, the movements can be quite complex, involving many, many joints and many faces, right? So during therapy, the uh, individual deliver delivering the treatment uses um, their training, their skill, their experience to know when to trigger the stimulation. Okay? The uh, challenge, however, is when the level of impairment is very high, in other words, when the ability to move has been uh, impaired severely or is completely absent, and then we're not really sure when to trigger the stimulation. And that's important because we think that that timing is actually quite important for the efficacy of the therapy, okay? And I think you know where I'm gonna go, okay? <laughs> so um, wouldn't it be great, great if we could have the same treatment in which the treating person would issue the command but now, somehow, we had this machine that would identify the person's intention to move and then would trigger the stimulation. And of course, the technology that does this is brain computer interfacing or brain machine interfacing. Um, 15 years ago, this may have sounded like a science fiction uh, story type of thing, but now I think it's common knowledge that this is actually possible. It's a technology that is uh, uh, quite feasible. Uh, so basically, a brain-computer interface is a machine that can use brain signals to control electronic devices. And even though uh, originally there was a lot of focus on this uh, technology as an assistive device, and it was something that would be used on a daily basis to go about uh, daily life, in the last 10 years or so, um, there has been a, 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 an increase in interest of using this technology as a therapeutic intervention. Okay, so just use it for a few weeks, a few months, uh, and then this continues to use. Pardon me. So this is exactly what we did, right? We record the activity of the brain with one electrode. And we look for uh, this particular signature right here. This is a decrease in power it is very well documented since the, I think the first time it was observed it was the 50s. Um, and uh, it's uh, quite interesting. It, it, it's something that's observable every time that we move. So if you're at rest and then all of a sudden you move, you will see the decrease in power. And the graph zero represents the onset of the movement. But what's really interesting is that we can actually see this also just by imagining that we're moving. And as we have seen in hundreds of sessions, it's also present when someone with paralysis attempts to move. Okay? So basically, we just detect this uh, potential, and then that triggers the stimulation. Other than that, the intervention remains exactly the same as, uh, as uh, 
you know, in the original picture that I showed you. Um, so I'm going to show you the first prototype that we had on the screen. You see a green uh, square that lights up whenever the intention to move of this uh, individual is detected. This is someone who had a stroke six years before he joined us in our studies. His uh, left arm was completely flaccid, so all the movements that you're going to see are produced by the electric stimulation and by my assistance. You can see that every phase of the movement is assisted or detected by the BCI and then um, assisted by the electrostimulation. And that's my real voice. Okay, we can modify the system very quickly to practice other movements. So this is lateral reaching, which actually has six different phases. And this is the same system just um, being used with someone uh, who had a stroke just to practice uh, hand opening, which is often quite challenging. Great. These are pictures that I took just a few weeks ago, except for the one on the bottom left, which is, of course, identical to what I just showed you. Um, as you can see, we continue to practice complex movements. In fact, we've had people practicing eating, right? And uh, all facilitated through uh, the uh, system that I showed you. Uh, we, we try to hide the brain-computer interface now from the patient, okay? So now we put it in the back of the person. We don't have a bell, or a beep that goes every time that it gets detected. And the reason why we do that is because in some cases, uh, the, the, the patients were more focused on whether or not they got the beep or not, rather than actually paying attention to the task that they were performing. So slowly we're learning uh, a little bit more about how we can actually use this, this uh, technology in the clinic. Now, uh, at the moment we have uh, two clinical trials. We're, we're testing it with two, 20 individuals with uh, spinal cord injury at different stages of, of their rehabilitation. So either very early, very shortly after they were injured, or two years after um, uh, they, uh, were, uh, they were hurt. Um, for that reason, I cannot share results with you, okay? But I can share with you two cases, the two original cases that we uh, used this uh, technology uh, uh, with. So these two individuals had uh, a stroke. Both of them uh, had severe hemiplegia, so that means that their ability to move um, was severely um, limited. And just by coincidence, they both came to us six years after uh, they had had the stroke. Okay? But uh, very interestingly, <laughs> they both uh, had tried a number of interventions during those six years, including state-of-the-art functional electrical stimulation therapy. And no other intervention really had um, produced any, any meaningful change. So we treated the red individual for 40 hours. This is pretty standard in, in our studies. Right? And after that, he had an improvement of six points in the scale. This is called the fugal meyer assessment uh, score, the uh, upper extremity uh, um, subcomponent. In this scale, any change of five and above is considered important. And basically it means that the person is able to do something that they were not able to do before. Okay. The blue individual, we treated for 80 hours, right? And you can see that uh, his improvement was three times uh, that minimum uh, important change. Okay. 
This is a video of before and after. So this is before. You can see that there's really no active arm movement. He has to lean to position his hand. In fact, he relies on the good hand to place the, the other hand. This is after the intervention. This is at the very end. In fact, we forgot to press record in the camera, so at this point he's actually quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, was, it was quite dramatic, the changes that we saw. I mean, you, you saw in the video, but uh, more importantly, there were meaningful changes. So he told us that he started gardening again. Uh, his gait was improved just by virtue of being able to swing his arm a little bit better. He didn't think it was important to tell us that he was able to clip his own fingernails. <laughs> uh, you know, so really... Uh, important changes that we saw. This is someone uh, with a spinal cord injury. He was injured two years ago. Uh, he was hit uh, by a car while he was riding his bicycle over just on Lakeshore. Um, for those who are not here, just a few blocks away. And uh, this accident happened two years before he joined our study. Okay. So this was the first time that we asked him to try to drink from a bottle of water. At this point, his arm is being stimulated and obviously he's being assisted by the therapist. In the background, you can see my belly and the same sweater that I'm wearing right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. And just a few sessions afterwards, that's him. Obviously, there's no assistance. There's no electrical stimulation. And, and towards the end, he was actually able to release the bottle without someone having to hold it in place. Yeah. So, so far, it looks like this combination of brain-computer interfacing and functional electrical stimulation therapy is viable. Right? Our system is... Uh, very simple, we designed it that way so that we could deploy it uh, into the clinic. Um, it appears to be effective when cases, in other cases where, where everything has, uh, has uh, failed, right? And something that I haven't really made enough emphasis on is the fact that because of the improvements that we saw in the two cases that I presented, now they're actually able to participate in other forms of therapy. Okay? So their function improved to a level in which now they can access therapies that before, because of the severity of their limitation, they were not able to, to, to take part in and therefore benefit. Okay? As you can imagine, tons of people have worked on this project, right? Uh, my email address is right there in the middle, if you want to contact me. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, very impressive. So before we um, have the opportunity to ask a question, I would uh, uh, like to ask the last speaker, Frank Gottschitt, to the podium. He's the Director of Artificial Intelligence um, from the Lee Kaching, and he will talk to us about explainable AI. Uh, I'm also a, a backup today, so I understand that there's going to be someone even more exciting uh, to talk to you, uh, but he disappeared a few days ago. So I hacked together these slides uh, a few days ago. Uh, some of you have seen many of the slides I hacked together, so you're going to be even more bored than the rest of them. Uh, but it's something that's very close to, uh, to my heart. Um, so um, I've been interested in AI for a very long time. Um, and we've seen an explosion of AI uh, relatively recently. But it wasn't always the way it is now. Uh, for a very long time, uh, the community didn't know exactly how we were going to go about uh, designing machines that could, could um, have intelligence. So there was a camp that thought they should think rationally, some that thought they should act rationally. This uh, was the majority of the work in artificial intelligence for decades. 
Uh, people build knowledge bases using predicate calculus and explicit knowledge encoded by, by experts, but this was very time consuming, uh, expensive, um, and prone to error. Uh, some people thought that we should get these machines to think like a human, but that would uh, necessitate um, understanding how humans think. Uh, Cesar is making a lot of um, you know, improvements in that area and others uh, in labs around Toronto, uh, but we're still not quite there yet. So the explosion of AI recently has really been around uh, this last point, uh, making machines that act like a human. Um, and to do this, we basically just get machines to mimic how humans perform on loads and loads of data. So we would show an image like the one shown here, um, to a person, the person labels what they see, and then we train the um, software to basically try to replicate what, what humans do. So we see a face here, for example, and we label this face. So up until very recently, up until about 2015, uh, these neural networks were getting very, very performant indeed, uh, and they were starting to mimic human performance. Um, and people started latching on to the idea that we could use uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in, um, in healthcare. Um, because they were kind of uh, achieving human-like performance. But in 2015, um, this sort of the crack started to appear. Uh, this paper came out, Deep Neural Networks Are Usually Fooled, and they showed that even the best um, uh, agents, uh, the machine learning agents that could detect uh, images with accuracies comparable to humans, uh, if you designed um, an adversarial neural network uh, that could synthesize fake images, uh, specifically designed to fool that first neural network, you could get behavior that was really, really bizarre. So these are some examples from this paper uh, in which these, these state-of-the-art neural networks were getting 99% confidence in identifying things like, um, up in the upper left, there's a robin and a cheetah, an armadillo. In the bottom half, there's things like baseballs and electric guitars. Um, and the neural network was confident that this is actually what it was seeing, and this sort of raised some, some alarm bells. Um, these, these, these agents don't think like us, and we really need a way to open up um, these, these neural networks and other machine learning models to explain what's actually going on to avoid these kind of unexplainable behaviors. So we want machine learning to be explainable, especially in healthcare, because we want to be able to identify any bias that might occur uh, within these uh, models and promote safety. Uh, we'd like to leverage domain expertise, so we want these, these uh, agents to be used by doctors and other clinicians. We want to use their wisdom. That is still very difficult to encode in, in modern machine learning. We want to make sure that models train on one data set, generalize to other data sets, and are consistent as they're used over time uh, with new and, and different kinds of data. And of course, we want to be able to trust the system, in, in particular in healthcare. So I'll talk about, about ways we can, we can approach explainability. Uh, but also, we might need to uh, have models that explain themselves. So there's some regulatory changes that are happening in the United States and Canada and Europe in which um, explainability is actually uh, mandated. So what do we actually mean by explainable? So the, the term explainable uh, is, is not fixed. Uh, there's a lot of debate. There's an entire paper, paper written about how the vocabulary in explainable AI has not uh, been uh, uh, settled yet. But I like this paper uh, from uh, Zach Lipton. Uh, from 2016, uh, because it kind of does a high-level overview of the different ways we can approach uh, explainability slash interpretability in machine learning. So we'll go through a couple of these different categories of explainability. So the first is simultability. Uh, we'd like to be able to get a holistic uh, view of what the machine learning agent is really uh, learning. So here are two kind of uh, traditional machine learning models called decision trees. Uh, the one on the left um, makes a decision by asking lots and lots of questions about lots and lots of different variables. Um, and even in this simple graph, it's relatively difficult to um, get a holistic view of what this decision tree is actually learning, whereas the one on the right um, only has about, um, about eight or nine different uh, components, so we can have a better understanding of what's going on on the right. It's exacerbated in real life, so this decision trees that you train automatically from data in real life can have hundreds of thousands of nodes, so it's even more of a problem in practice. But as you trim these decision trees and make them simpler so that we can understand them, there's a compromise. You also um, reduce the accuracy, typically, in what these models are able to achieve. Uh, decomposability is the second type of explainability. Um, normally in healthcare, we do things like logistic or uh, linear regressions. And these uh, approaches are usually decomposable into components that we can understand uh, themselves. So we might have um, a uh, linear regression we're trying to estimate the length of a stay in a hospital, but these are usually composed of things like age and, and gender and so on. Um, but modern machine learning usually does away with these sort of um, uh, expert-derived features and instead automatically learns uh, the lowest level variables automatically from the data. So we're likely to get something as 
complicated as Euler's formula or an autoregressive function or some other weird combination of the raw input. Um, and that weird combination won't necessarily be very understandable either. Uh, the third type is algorithmic transparency. This is a bit more subtle. Um, but there's very different, many different kinds of machine learning models, and some of them are just more inherently understandable than others. So on the left, we see something called a support vector machine, a good old-fashioned machine learning model, in which we basically draw a boundary between, in this case, red squares and turquoise circles. And I think we all understand what this boundary means. It's a boundary between the classes. Um, and moreover, the uh, algorithm that automatically adjusts that boundary is guaranteed to have, uh, it's guaranteed to converge. Uh, but the modern neural networks that are achieving state-of-the-art accuracies, not only are they very, very, like the, the shape of the decision boundary is not understandable. So on the right, we see um, a, a very simple neural network. Every green box is another neural network. This is from Google. Um, I, I think I challenge anyone to understand what's going on in that picture. Um, and moreover, when you train neural networks, you, you get generally pretty good accuracy, but um, it, it's not guaranteed to converge to the, um, the uh, global optimum. Uh, and finally, visualization. So this is sort of the canonical paper that keeps on coming up when people talk about machine learning and healthcare. Uh, this group um, learned to differentiate benign skin lesions from malignant ones using about 130,000 images. Uh, and in, in dermatology, we already had a taxonomy of the ways that skin disease can break down. So there's skin disease, there's benign, uh, which has a bunch of subtypes, malignant, which has a bunch of subtypes, and so on. So we had a standard neural network, or they had a standard neural network that uh, just basically learned the binary distinction between these two types, benign and malignant. Uh, and once again, they got very good accuracy. So these are our sensitivity specificity curves in blue for the neural network, and all the red dots are the performance of 20 of the 21 best dermatologists they could find, and everyone's very happy that on this set of pale-skinned people, the, um, the neural network did, did quite well. Um, but more importantly, I think, for this discussion is that you could actually take part of the neural network, the last layer, and open it up according to a, um, a technique developed uh, here in Toronto called Disney, um, in which you can kind of automatically see where the data points you feed into the neural network kind of are spread out. It's kind of like clustering in a way, uh, but you're seeing what the neural network is learning. And you can see that, you know, basal cell carcinomas cluster together, nevi cl cluster together, uh, melanomas cluster together. So this is kind of a validation that without being told anything about that taxonomy that we use or that the dermatologists use, uh, the neural network is automatically able to kind of recreate uh, the taxonomy. Uh, so I uh, have a bunch of different hats, and one of them is at uh, Surgical Safety Technologies, where we have something called the OR Black Box, uh, which is deployed around Canada and the United States and Europe so far. Basically, we have, um, we've outfitted operating rooms with you know, video cameras uh, of what the team is doing, microphones to hear what they're talking about. We have endoscopic and laparoscopic cameras. We have physiology, environmental factors, other kinds of wearable devices, um, uh, EMR data for clinical decision support. And the output of the OR black box are things like assessments of risks, analysis of safety threats, um, assessing surgical performance, so how well is this individual actually doing technically and non-technically, um, and so on. But it's, it's very crucial. So when, when I joined this group um, almost a year ago, you know, the, um, this is a very high-risk uh, scenario. So all of these aspects of why we want to have explainable AI sort of became one of uh, my focus as I'm leading a group there. So we obviously want to re remove bias uh, from the models that are used in these critical situations promote safety. Um, the, I, I'm, I'm very lucky to work with a large team of clinicians at St. Mike's and Surgical Safety who kind of guide the AI team, tell us this is what we want you to do, so, and they interpret the output of our systems. Of course, we, we want to go to different hospitals. We want to make sure that something trained at St. Mike's um, generalizes to hospitals we're working with in California, for example, and obviously we want to trust the system. There's a bit of blood on the next slide, FYI, so turn away if you're squeamish. Uh, so one of the tools we have is a laparoscopic video, and uh, we're just trying to detect thermal injuries and bleeding injuries um, as they come up. Um, so we use neural networks. We're, we're pretty accurate, so we have about 0.88% 88, under the curve, which is state of the art, but there's still that, that 0.12, which is errorful. So when we have situations where there's false negatives and false positives uh, for bleeding, we better be able to, to figure out what's going on. So in other words, we want to be able to pinpoint you know, where the neural network thinks the bleeding is actually occurring so to, to validate it. And there's many ways we can do this. Um, <laughs> you're never supposed to put an equation on a slide. Um, but this one's relatively uh, straightforward. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a neural network is basically just a function. Uh, we have input x, and the function f 
outputs whatever we wanted to output, like there's bleeding occurring in this image. Um, so this is a paper from, uh, from 2017. Computer scientists love working with images of animals, so they dealt with a lot of pictures, like classifying cats and dogs and crocodiles and stuff like that. So the pixels are input, the pixels are x, and the function f of x just kind of tells what, what animal's in the scene. Um, there's something called the first order Taylor decomposition, which takes arbitrary functions f of x, including neural networks, and decomposes them into a bunch of terms, including a differential function, d of f, like the differential of the function with respect to its input x. Uh, and what this paper does is it kind of applies it to neural networks. Um, so if f of x is a whole neural network, then can you kind of decompose the output of the neural network in terms of its component parts. So they have this, this function r sub j, which is basically the relevance um, of a neuron to a decision uh, downstream. And you basically just implement the Taylor expansion going backwards. So what you get with an auxiliary neural network, um, which kind of listens to the first one, is a mapping of what pixel, what neurons were most useful in making the decision that it made. Uh, and you can bubble this all the way back down to the input. Uh, so you can get a kind of a heat map over the input saying these are the pixels that were most important to, to me, the neural network. So here are some examples. You have frogs. You know, the pixels that were most uh, useful in determining the sh that this is a hammerhead shark are the pixels around the hammerhead shark. The pixels most uh, useful to telling that this is a cat are the pixels around the cat and so on. I want to point out that I, I like this method and I like methods like this one, but there's still a lot of controversy even within this subsection of explainable AI, which itself is just sort of like the Wild West. Um, there's sort of uncertainty about um, the sensitivity of these approaches, these explainable AI approaches. If you apply a bit of noise to the data or if you just shift the data in certain ways, sometimes the explanations you get out are kind of drastically different and we, we want them to be less, less drastically different. So there's still a lot of research going on in this area. Uh, and we have a paper that came out a few weeks ago in JAMA Surgery where we basically talk about uh, what we're doing, uh, applying explainable AI to safe interoperative uh, decision support. So finally, I mentioned earlier that not only do we want explainable AI in healthcare settings, but in, I think most cases we're going to actually need to have explainable AI in healthcare settings. So I'm not a lawyer, so uh, the following, take it with a grain of salt. Um, so literally, um, yeah, up until a year ago, there were no uh, products that were uh, regulated by the FDA or Health Canada that explicitly used machine learning as, as a major component. Um, but in the last year, um, just over a dozen of them have been approved by the FDA as under class one or class two medical devices. And here's, here's most of them. Uh, I wanna focus on apples. So if you, if you search the web, you can find the letter that the FDA wrote to Apple's lawyers. Uh, where they, say, they said, yes, you're, you're now able to sell this Apple Watch as a, as a medical device. And on page two, um, there is a section on the controls that are applied uh, to this device. And there's a lot of cool stuff going on here, but the thing I wanted to mention is that the FDA explicitly told Apple that if you wanna be a medical device, um, you have to have human factors and usability testing that demonstrate, among other things, that the user can interpret the device output and understand when to seek medical care. So at least sort of tangentially explainable AI, uh, maybe by accident, is starting to be integrated into the outputs of, of the FDA when they're, they're regulating devices. Um, we're aware of uh, the GDPR. Uh, so the GDPR extends uh, some automated decision-making rights way back from 95 in the Data Protection Directive. Um, and they add this kind of right to an explanation in Recital 71. So they talk about some other things uh, about you know, decisions being made uh, for patients using automated methods. And they well, I emphasize that they say that such processing should be subject to suitable safeguards, which should include specific information to the data subject and the right to obtain an explanation of the decision. So in the, um, the, the um, uh, workup to the GDPR, uh, the regulators started integrating the idea of explainable AI also into the regulations. I wanna point out that Recital 71 is a recital, and recitals are not um, binding um, in the sense that other articles in GDPR are, but at least it's a start. Uh, and finally, um, so I, I was the, uh, the first uh, Canadian chair uh, on the International Standards Organization's Subcommittee on Artificial Intelligence, um, which started just last year. Um, and we, we have five working groups now. When it started, we only had three study groups um, talking about computational approaches and use cases and we're still working. Um, but uh, one of the working groups now is focused on trustworthiness. It's, it's the most, uh, probably the most uh, rigorous or like uh, active working group. And in it there, we're working towards standards of transparency, verifiability, explainability, and controllability. 
um, which I think is very exciting. Um, they're, they're, they're all very bureaucratic and political, so it's going very um, uh, slowly in baby steps, but they're all making really positive uh, improvements. So uh, finally, um, so there's this quote that technology will replace 80% of what doctors do. Um, we have to make sure that it's the right 80%, but the idea is that this whole 20% that's going to be done by humans, and AI has to interface with humans in some way. Um, so explainability, despite what I was talking about, is not just about kind of avoiding or understanding the problems that occur uh, in these neural networks and other models, but also we want to be able to use explainability in positive cases to bridge the gap and communicate between machine learning models and the humans who use it. Um, so I, this is already mentioned, I think, by the keynote, that there's a study that showed that even in situations where AI is not as performant as the best humans out there, really if you combine the output of machine learning with the best humans, you get performance that is much better than either of those two um, organisms uh, working uh, on their own. So kind of making sure that we've been humans in the loop and training machine learning models to be sensitive to uh, human needs is going to be extremely important going forward. So I think explainable AI is going to lead to safer AI, um, which can lead to improved healthcare, but we still have to be very careful with, with how we're dealing with this brand new technology. Thank you. Well, thanks to all of the speakers, and uh, thank you for stay, um, staying in time. I think we do have time for a couple of questions, and um, one question has been kind of um, burning me since you were speaking, and I was reading the comments. So for me as a radiologist, um, question to Alex, do I still have a job in five years or should I go out and plan early retirement now? So that's, that's the easy question and uh, I have a lot of respect for a lot of people in AI uh, and a lot of respect for people in the medical field, but sometimes each field underestimate or overestimate certain property of those fields. So you have to be very careful when you make such a blunt statement that in 10 years, radiology will disappear because, in a sense, you will create a shortage of radiology and you will probably kill people with that statement. So I think it's, um, I see really AI expanding the field, not only of radiologists, but other type of field and the type of example that I showed you. When you look at an image, you'll be able to predict uh, genomic markers. You'll be able to uh, predict certain type of pathology and let's not forget that those type of prediction are never perfect. So if you have the explainability part, the doctor will be able to more efficiently have quantitative tools and predictive tools to make the ultimate judgment. So can we summarize that AI will not replace radiologists, but it will replace those radiologists that are not using AI? <laughs> they will retire by then. <laughs> Any other question in that context? <laughs> question to, to Caesar. Um, so I think very impressive um, your presentation you. and I really think you give patients hope. So question is, can you use any automated processes that more patients have access to that amazing technology? What do you mean by automated processes? Well, I'm sorry. Right now, I think it's, it's still very um, user intensive. So you need to have a physiotherapist helping the patient. So I think it's a very limited number of patients that um, benefit yeah. right now. So how can, you make, how can you make this wider available? Yeah, so at the moment, perhaps the most significant challenge is just placing the EEG electrodes to be able to record that. Um, the signals that we get. And also, as you probably know, recording AG is not as simple as, as, as uh, one would really want to get. So I think there's significant improvements to be done from that perspective. That goes hand in hand with also the capacity to deliver functional electrical stimulation uh, properly. So there's also, there's, there's certain skills that needs to be developed in both uh, uh, forms as well. We can also fantasize of perhaps uh, combining this technology with automatic entity, so for example, a robot, right? That could assist a little bit on the manipulation of the person, although um, we still have, I think, quite a bit to go in that, in that, uh, in that uh, field. Those are the things that I can think about right now. I don't know if they were satisfactory, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. David.
find this really remarkably parallel to the deep learning architectures mm -hmm. that, so we've learned that deep learning, if you go more and more and more, more data in, the prediction strength goes yeah. up typically. Um, yet in the human context, you're reinforcing this pattern over and over and over again, and you're getting more out of that. And the human ability to be there as a physiotherapist to do that over and over and over again is limited, but the machine lets us do it over and over. I, I find those parallels really interesting, and, and, there's, and it goes back to the time comment from Alex. I mean, the ability to repeat something over and over again and then have the repair processes or whatever the, mm -hmm. the rehabilitation elements that are happening biologically get reinforced. I, I find the parallels between those quite interesting. I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I mean, the, 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 a fundamental component in, in, in this aspect is, is definitely repeating things multiple times. Uh, sometimes multiple times for patients, maybe eight times. And after eight times, that's it. The person next to starts it. So we need to keep that in mind as well. It's not only the therapist that is repeating over and over and over again, but the uh, different to a computer or you know an automatic system like that, it, the, the patient performing the task also has a very significant limit in some times, right? I mean, eight trials, that's it. Session's over, right? Or we need to do something else. There's a big um, question right now as to whether or not more is better. Okay, so that, that's a, that's a, we we really don't know at what point. What is the optimal level of, of uh, number of repetitions that a person has to do before this, uh, or to optimize the effectiveness of the uh, of the intervention? Mm. My good thing, I'm not a clinician, but uh, that it changes from person to to person. Yeah? But you bring something very important, which is, I mean, the, the the what we're doing, we think, is not just focus on extrinsic factors, and by that I mean the strength of the muscle or contractures of the muscle, but we're really trying to reprogram the nervous system, right? And this is, this is why the, the timing that I mentioned is important, this is why the electrical stimulation is important. What we're doing with that is actually providing feedback uh, that then the body, the nervous system uses to uh, take advantage of any remaining neural structures relevant to that uh, uh, to, to recover movement. Yeah. I, I think I answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Hi, for Dr. Ruzic, uh, do you see some algorithms as sort of being never explainable and they just won't be able to be used in certain ways? Or do you see it's just a, a problem of not enough resources have been spent trying to explain them because they've been good enough for the uses that they have been used at? Uh, so I, um, I, um, I think everything is kind of possible, but uh, maybe not like in the next five or ten years. So I kind of think that with, with enough work, any, any machine learning model can become explainable to some extent. The question is really like what, what kind of explainability you want. Um, so I, I talked about like four different kind of ways that explainability can be broken down. Some might be more important for different contexts. Um, uh, and there's other ways that you can think about about um, uh, concepts of explainability. And I didn't even get a chance to really talk about different ways that people have approached explainability. So I kind of mentioned, you know, you can get an image and you get a heat map about where the neural network's making a decision. Um, a lot of what we're doing at University of Toronto um, and Vector are looking at text and kind of highlighting the, the textual fields um, that um, uh, kind of presage a decision, which is like a different technology. And still others use sort of examples. So a lot, a lot of decisions in healthcare have to be done based on precedent. Um, so there's a great uh, postdoc at Vector who does a lot of work in sort of synthesizing examples and so on. Um, so there's a ton of, of tools we can apply to the problem. So anything's possible. Uh, the question is kind of uh, when. And, um, and I think the more complicated neural networks um, that we didn't get a chance to talk about, like there's certain parts of them that are going to be opaque basically indefinitely or going to be beyond the human ability to comprehend. Uh, but as long as we can see the important stuff in it and we can detect errors before they occur um, uh, and, and still uh, use an aspect of explainability to, um, to uh, avoid problems, achieve safety, that's, that's going to be good enough, I think. Alex, you want so to come on? So one, maybe one subtlety, so you might have a model that provides a good answer for a very, uh, with a very accurate um, 
uh, uh, response, but maybe the model is, predict is looking at something else. So uh, giving you an example, we were working on, on uh, survival, sur survival prediction and response rate, looking at nodules, and the model was performing pretty well. But in fact, when we looked deeper, the model was looking at the heart and seeing the effect on, on chemo on the heart. So you have to make sure that during the training phase, the model looks at the right parameters um, to predict correctly the outcome. Okay, if there are no pressing questions, I think we are a little bit um, run over time anyway. Lunch is waiting. I would like to thank again the speakers and thank the audience.